Hi everyone. I don't know how you felt as we reached the end of 2020. I have no idea at all how you feel looking ahead into 2021. But this is a new year and I want to wish you a very happy new year. And I want us to, at the start of this time to fix on something that isn't uncertain and isn't unsure and that will not disappoint. And that is the character and faithfulness of God. So let me read to you the opening verses of Psalm 89 and then in music and in the words of uh, great hymns, the splendour of the King and how great thou art, we're going to come before God in worship. The psalmist says, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth I will make your faithfulness known throughout all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. The splendor of a king Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice all the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide And trembles at his voice Trembles at his voice How great is our God Sing with me how great is our God And all will see how great How great is our God. Age to age he stands, and time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The God had three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and how great is our God Sing with me how great is our God And all will see how great How great is our God Name above all names Worthy of our praise My heart will sing how great is our God. You're the name above all names. You are worthy of our praise. And my heart will sing how great is our God. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to God 
his son not sparing sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great God our Father, in giving us Jesus Christ, your precious Son, you give us nothing less than your own self and all that is yours. We thank you that through him we're welcomed into your family, fully known and fully loved. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, who comforts and convicts, lifting us from ourselves to see your glory. At the start of this new year, we set before you all that troubles us, hurts from the past that cling to us, grief for family and friends whom we miss, regrets and disappointments over scrambled plans. We set before you our weaknesses that leave us daunted by all that might be asked of us as we face pressures and tedium and new circumstances at work and family and church. We set before you our doubts and our questions and our guilt and our shame and also our fear, our anxieties for ourselves, our family and our friends and for our nation. We take all these things and place them in the faithful hands which you have stretched out to us in Jesus Christ our Saviour. Take us as we are, strengthen our trust in you and show us again that you are utterly sufficient for us. And hear us as we say together the prayer Jesus has given to us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Many years of abject failure have convinced me that New Year's resolutions are not for me. But at the start of 2021, I decided to come up with a list not of resolutions, but of questions that I feel I want to think about and try and answer at the start of this new year. So these are personal questions and you could probably come up with your own list. But here they are. Question number one, the start of this year, what can go wrong? A bit negative. Number two, more positively, what challenges lie ahead? Three, more pointedly, will I cope with them? Four, what's God asking from me? Five, am I willing to give it? Six, what am I asking from God? And seven, is God willing to give it? Eight, what relationships matter to me? 
and nine. Well, I treat them like they matter to me. 10, what am I looking forward to? 11, what am I anxious about? 12, are my expectations too high or too low? 13, what might trip me up this year? 14, what might help me to thrive this year? 15, who do I know that has my back? 16, who might need me to back them up? 17, where are my blind spots? 18, who can point them out? 19, who am I listening to? 20, well, I have what it takes. And 21, what if I don't? Now, those questions are clearly my own questions. And most seem to me to be worthwhile asking. But I suppose a question that we face as we turn to the Bible is whether God's word actually connects with our lives and does it actually address the kind of questions that we carry around with us? You know, we can read the words, we may or may not understand what they mean, but we want to be sure that they are meaningful and meaningful for us. And the Bible is often treated like a reference book. So it has its place, often closed and up on a shelf. And we expect it to perform a certain function, to provide answers to a certain sort of question or information on certain topics. Of course, when we actually open the Bible and read it for ourselves, it becomes very clear that it looks nothing like an encyclopedia or a manual for life. It's not actually that easy to find answers for our questions, you know, important questions like, you know, what should I be doing with my life? Or how do I deal with this messy situation? And in fact, what we find is that it begins to ask questions of us. And we're the ones on the back foot. So the Bible doesn't offer us a resource for us to use when we please but it extends to us the possibility of a relationship. It's not a how-to guide that leaves us better equipped for our own little lives, but it, it summons us into a different sort of life, life together with one another and with God. And so if we come to the Bible with our questions, they won't be immediately resolved, but we also discover that we're not alone with our questions or abandoned. At the start of this year, we're going to uh, be turning to the very beginning of the New Testament and reading through Matthew's Gospel, one of four uh, accounts of the life of Jesus. And we're shown who Jesus is. And we're called uh, and invited and challenged to know him and to follow him. It's called Matthew's Gospel, but we really have no idea who wrote this account. Uh, the title was a, a later edition. And the whole thrust of what is in the account actually points away from the writer, doesn't give anything away, and points towards uh, their main object, this man, Jesus Christ. And we see throughout the Gospel that Jesus uh, often assumes the role of a, a teacher. And so there are, there are plenty of questions and answers. But as the gospel comes to its conclusion, there isn't an examination. People respond differently to Jesus, some doubt, some worship. But for those who follow and respond to the call, the summons, the invitation, there is a commission and a promise. They are to go and make disciples. And they're to do so knowing the promise that Jesus will be with them uh, and that Jesus is for them always and wherever they will go. But that's racing ahead. We're going to begin at the beginning and Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, reading from verse 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Amminadab. Amminadab, the father of Nation. 
Nashon, the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asa, Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram, Jehoram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Amon, Amon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, the father of Abihud, Abihud, the father of Elakim, Elakim, the father of Azor, Azor, the father of Zadok, Zadok, the father of Akim, Akim, the father of Eliud, Eliud, the father of Elizar, Elizar, the father of Methan, Methan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Thus there were fourteen generations in all, from Abraham to David, fourteen from David to the exile in Babylon, and fourteen from the exile to the Messiah. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfil what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Amen. God, our Father, we are so hungry for good news. Help us to see all that you hold out for us in your word. Through Jesus Christ. Amen. As someone who spends quite a lot of time uh, teaching and preaching from the Bible, I'm very wary of the inconvenient truth that we can open up the Bible with our expectation or someone else's promise that it will have something to say to us, that it will offer us truth, that it will offer us good news, that it will offer us a, an encounter with God and all the rest of it. And then we open up a passage like Matthew chapter 1 and within half a dozen verses, expectations begin to lower. We begin to question all that's been promised because we're reading someone else's family tree, a dry list of names and offer very little in the way of background or embellishment along the way. And if we overcome the, the temptation to just immediately give up, it's likely that we'll give in to at least to the temptation simply to skip ahead to about verse 18, where the story really kicks into gear with characters like Joseph and Mary, a dream and an angel. I think, well, that's a bit better. But we're not going to skip verses 1 to 17 today. And when we're pressed to read them, perhaps out of sense of duty or completeness. Maybe you're the kind of person who never ever skips the title sequence or credits at the beginning of a TV show. Or worse, if you're someone who's been asked to read these verses aloud, that the sheer unfamiliarity of all those names can, can actually make us very tentative and hesitant and uncomfortable. You know, we can try our best, it takes us back to primary school, trying to honour each syllable and then sometimes, you know, we almost add a, a question mark as if to cover our inadvertent mispronunciations. You know, you can feel the confidence seeping out of you as you take a stab at Aminadab, the son of Nashon. And it's briefly restored as we come to Ruth 
and Boaz and Jesse and David. And then there's this long line of forgotten kings that leaves us uh, struggling to maintain any kind of rhythm or interest or sense of what we're reading or why. And then at the end, we get to where we knew we were heading all along, thanks to verse one's neat summary from David from Abraham via David to Jesus, who's called the Messiah. And we say, well, what is all of that dry, unpronounceable detail there for? And there are other ways you might choose to begin an account of Jesus's extraordinary life. None of the other gospels begins in this way. And after the briefest word of introduction, Mark begins, really in the thick of the action, Jesus, an adult on the move, making things happen. Luke, uh, with the anticipation uh, and then the birth and then the, the childhood of Jesus. And John with this extraordinary, soaring, God's eye view, uh, stretching beyond time to eternity. In the beginning was the word. Whereas Matthew begins with this long list of father, father of father of father of father, with the occasional mother thrown in for good measure. So what can we make of it? begins like this. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And immediately what Matthew is doing is inviting us to see that the story he's about to tell, the story about Jesus, is connected in a profound way with another story. The story of Israel, the story of God and God's people. And in our Bibles, there, there might be a few blank pages uh, separating almost like a buffer between the Old and New Testaments. But actually from the perspective of uh, the New Testament, for a, a gospel writer like Matthew, there's no barrier whatsoever. The Old Testament flows uh, right through the New. The story of Jesus is completely soaked in the history and the hopes and the fears and the questions that arise from the story of Israel. And to mention here, Abraham is to speak of this man of faith who, who stood at the very beginning of Israel's story. Or to speak of David is to think of God's anointed king, the, perhaps the high point of Israel's story so far. And we're told, of course, that Jesus is the Messiah, which means he was anointed, that he was set apart in a particular way, chosen by God to fulfil God's purposes for God's people. And he's this idea of a Messiah who will, in some sense, make all the difference. Is someone, something that is promised and longed for right throughout the story of God's people. And as we read through the Old Testament, we find memories, we find longing, we find half-abandoned hopes slowly coming into focus. And it comes into crystal clear focus upon this single person, upon Jesus and the story that Matthew will tell. And the opening words of verse one could more literally be rendered, rendered the book of the Genesis of Jesus Christ, which of course calls to mind the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, a book full of beginnings. One commentator suggested we might call Matthew Genesis 2, the sequel, and that might seem a stretch. But actually, if we return to these opening words, having read the whole of Matthew's Gospel, which culminates, of course, in the, the resurrection of Jesus, perhaps that does seem more fitting. Because we have here the beginning, not just of uh, a life or the story of a life, but we come to see that through that life, there is a new beginning for all of creation. But once again, when we speak like this, we're in danger of, of sailing right over the words of the text. Do verses 2 to 17 with all those names really add anything to the those big important claims that are made in verse 1? Or are we simply being shown some of Matthew's background working that could just as easily be tucked away in a footnote or in an appendix? Let me draw out a few points. Firstly, for those who have really know or have really scrutinised the history of Israel and of God's people, uh, whether those back in Matthew's generation or those who study it today, it's apparent that the genealogy here is not merely a cut, copy and paste uh, from one of the history books. And actually, 
From the perspective, the rigorous standards of a modern historian, it becomes clear that it's selective in places it's slightly inaccurate or at least incomplete. That's to misunderstand its purpose here at the beginning of the Gospel. It's not to demonstrate that Matthew's done his homework and should be taken seriously. It's there to make a serious theological point, a point about who God is and what God is doing and who Jesus is and why Jesus matters. And so as we go through the names, we're being swept very rapidly through the centuries and we're not stopping at every station, but we're left in very little doubt of where we've come from, the promise made to Abraham and where we have ended up with the son of Mary, Jesus, who is the Messiah. And we see from the way it's set out in our Bibles and from the words in verse 17 that offer a little bit of explanation, where we have three lots of 14 generations, that this genealogy is very carefully structured. In fact, we have the story of Jesus's ancestry painted really in three broad strokes. First, from Abraham, with whom God made his great promise that he would be a people with a place, that they would be a blessed and be a blessing to the nations, that through Abraham's descendants, through Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Joseph's big brother, all the way through to David. And then we it's really an upward movement that goes from obscurity to life in a promised land with God in the midst of his people. And the second movement, however, the second lot of 14, is very much a downward movement through failure and futility, disappointment and disaster, spiritual moral decline. And it culminates in the crisis of exile, being taken from that promised land, being defeated, the temple destroyed. And the third movement, the third set of 14, is really the day of small things. It's the new start that came after exile, but not so much build back better, but hang on in there. Um, Hope that God will not have ultimately forget his people or his promises, hoping that God will do something that he'll save and restore his people. And so in seeing it like this, set out so deliberately, these three blocks, it offers a sense of order and completeness and sets up an anticipation that if there is to be something next, something to follow, it will be something new, a new era, uh, a new hope, a new beginning. Let's get even more into the detail because there's plenty of surprises when we consider this list of names. This is not the best of the best of the best. Jesus's family tree has some seriously crooked branches. I mean, amongst this list of fathers are some uh, notable failures, some who we'd want to judge even more harshly than that, those who are wicked or violent or negligent. Others are simply ordinary and unremarkable. You know, take someone like Boaz. Boaz was a good man, but really he, he was a farmer with no influence or reputation beyond his own community. Taken as a whole, it's very hard to discern any common quality that sets apart this uh, list of those who are part of Jesus's family tree, apart from the fact that God has chosen them. You know, Matthew shows that God has stitched together insiders and outsiders, sinners, saints, towering kings, and these half-remembered names into a family, really brought together by God's grace and for his glory. This is how God works. And it was then and is now totally contrary to the way we expect or imagine things will work. And more intriguingly still is the inclusion in this line of Jesus's ancestors of of four women. You know, the culture then, very uh, male-centric. It's very surprising that any women were included. It's perhaps even more surprising to see which four are included. You know, the stories of Tamar and Rahab and Ruth and, and Bathsheba, who was the wife of Uriah, were you know, kind of colourful to say the least, you know, in various ways demonstrating extraordinary faith and, and daring, or at other points being a foil to display the weakness and the failure of some of these men, like David, for example. 
And all four stand, in a sense, as outsiders to the people of God. Yet they are given this extraordinary prominence in the unfolding story, this retelling of the story of God's people, culminating in God's Messiah. And we see here, we hear here the first sounding of a, a note that's going to be repeated right through Matthew's Gospel, that this good news, this good news is good news for all nations. But the greatest surprise of all comes at the very end of the genealogy. There are all these fathers, and then there is the father who isn't mentioned at all. Father to son, father to son, father to son, all the way to Joseph. Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. No father to speak of. <laughs> makes us question the whole exercise, all these generations, only to trip at the very final hurdle. How strange. And this omission provokes the very question that interests Matthew and that he intends to answer. You know, who is Jesus, really? Who is the Messiah? What is the link between Jesus and all these centuries that have gone before of promise and waiting and judgment and rescue? The genealogy pauses there and there's no further comment on it beyond spelling out the, the groupings of the four teens. And then we're taken from this dry, selective, structured, surprising genealogy into the more familiar but nonetheless extraordinary narrative of Matthew 1, 18 to 25, the story of the birth of Jesus. And the question that the genealogy does not answer is very much Joseph's question, you know, who is the father of the child that Mary is expecting? Mary is his fiancée, she's pregnant, and Joseph knows that he is not the father. And actually caught cold by this turn of events that uh, no one would choose, he, he tries to do the right thing by the law, by God's law. We read about it in Deuteronomy 24, and the right thing by Mary. You know, and as we read, he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. You get a sense of Joseph's ordinary decency shining through. He, this is someone who's considerate, who is careful with others, who thinks things through before he sets his course. Yet the path that seems right to Joseph is not the path that he is to walk. And while Joseph sleeps, God speaks, and, and Joseph is called to go a different way. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. You are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Joseph is on the inside track here. He is being told that something new is beginning, that this really is a Genesis, a second Genesis, and Genesis, we've mentioned already, the very first book this of the Bible, the book of beginnings, begins by saying, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And the angel tells Joseph that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, has been bringing life and fullness within the womb of his young fiancée. And so he's to hold steady. He doesn't need to be afraid. Things are happening, but it's God who is making them happen. He's to hold steady that this unexpected son is to be received by him as a gift, as his son. And he's to name this son Jesus. Jesus that means the Lord saves, capturing at once the identity and the role of this child. They are the Lord. They come to save. Joseph's just to hold steady. The call of God upon Joseph's life is simply to trust in what God has done, what God is saying, and in what God will do through this child Jesus. And in verses 24 to 25, uh, we see that Joseph trusts and obeys, he does what is asked, and he sees what God had promised. And, uh, and in verses 22 to 23, 
Matthew does what he will do at various points through his gospel. From the, the close quarters of the characters and the story as they interact with one another, he, he pulls right back, right back from the intimacies of uh, Joseph's thought process and Joseph's dreams to see this much bigger picture. And Matthew calls to mind the, the, the centuries old words from the prophet Isaiah and reads them afresh in the light of what God has now done in Jesus. And there's a lot more that we could say about this link uh, between what Matthew says here and Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. But the overarching message is to say that in Jesus, God is giving expression to a deep commitment, a commitment with deep roots, a commitment to be God with and for his people, to be God with us. What is promised to Joseph in that extraordinary personal way is the outworking of what God has long intended and promised. It is the climax of a, an unfolding story with roots that go back beyond Joseph, beyond his father and grandfather, even beyond his great ancestor, David. God is at work in, in history. Uh, and that's rocky ground, spoiled in so many ways and overshadowed by sin. God is at work in outsiders and sinners. God is at work in ordinary people and those with extraordinary responsibility. And God is now to be seen with his people in this person, in this Jesus, who will save his people from their sins. And this was a low ebb in the history of God's people. But for God to say that Jesus will save them from their sins is not to do less than what they long for, but actually to do more. And at the start of this year, as we look to the future, OK, we have our questions. Questions, some of them loom very large. Some of them we hesitate uh, to ask because we fear the answer. We also start the year, of course, with a, with a past. You know, we carry with us all the, the exhaustion from last year, past disappointments and griefs, the consequences of things that we've done or not done or things that have happened to us already. And right here, right now, we live in this present moment that comes with a, an air of unreality. So many things strange, so many things uncertain. But what God offers to us is a relationship. What God offers to us is a relationship uh, with him through Jesus Christ. And in coming to know Jesus, to see that God is with us and to hear from Jesus that invitation to follow and to experience life together with God as part of his people. And this God is not deterred in any way by our past. There is a depth to God's mercy that can deal with with the ugly uh, bits of our story, with the skeletons in the cupboard. This God doesn't ignore our present uh, for all the anxiety and confusion that hangs in the air. In Christ, we see that God is with us. And from Christ, we hear that he is with you always to the very end of the age. And as we shall see, as we go on working through this gospel, this message of good news, Life that begins or begins again with Jesus can face the future not alone, not resigned, but secure and with a purpose and with good news to share. And in the light of all this, we can take the words of the psalm as our own. Once again, Psalm 89, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I'll declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven. Amen.
Spirit, sword for the fight. Be thou my dignity, thou my delight. Thou my soul shelter, and thou my high tower. Raise thou me henward, O power of my power. Riches I need not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, now and always. Thou and thou only, the first in my heart. My King of heaven, my treasure. Oh, bright and sun, heart of my own heart, whatever before, still be my vision, oh, ruler of all. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>